There's the drone, which means this is a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly podcast. Hello, welcome along. Uh, full marks for listening to the smartest show in the universe. My name's Dan. I am your guide in the eternal, everlasting quest to make our brains loads bigger. Uh, today, we'll talk about one of the most deadly gardens in the world. I mean, seriously, it's not somewhere that you can like have a picnic in the summer without probably dying. Uh, Also, we'll hear about some special robo nerve cells, which could help save lives. And I will also answer some of your questions. Today, they're all about electricity and itches. First, let's find out how some things that you use every single day are made with one of our favourite geniuses on the show. This is Sir Sidney McSprocket. How's it made? Oh, hello, Sir Sidney McSprocket here. I've been in action capturing facts all about manufacturing. It's for this rather splendid stipendiary compendium I'm compiling. You just ask it how something is made, and it'll oblige with a fulsome explanation. Now, marbles are a lot of fun. These small glass balls are very attractive, and there's all manner of games you can play with them. Ever wondered how they're manufactured? Well, let's find out. You don't have to be a genius to have figured out that the main ingredient of a marble is glass. It makes them very hard and gives them that rather lovely chinking noise. Glass is made from a mix of sand, soda lime, silica and other ingredients added for decoration. Recycled glass is also often used. Step one. The raw materials are fed into enormous furnaces and heated for more than a day to over 1,200 degrees Celsius. That's enough to melt it into a thick, sticky liquid. Step two. The sticky liquid is pushed out of the furnace in a long sausage and a cutting machine slices it into equal globs of molten glass. Step three. These globs slide down chutes on spinning cast iron rolls. It's this rolling that creates the perfect spherical shape. It also helps the newly formed marbles to cool. Step four. Some marbles have a rather lovely swirl inside them. This is achieved by inserting different coloured glass inside the globs before they are rolled in shape. Step five. The marbles will be sorted into sizes, and those which are too big or too small will be sent for recycling. A final polish removes any dirt, and they're ready for packaging. Marbles come in a tremendous range of colours with swirls in every shade. Incredible to think that in the past they managed to achieve similar effects only using the heat of the furnace and the glass worker's skills. Now, I must get on, but come back soon and find out more about manufacturing with my splendid stipendiary compendium. How's it made? With support from the Royal Commission for the 1851 Exhibition. Find out more at funkidslive.com. Right, it's time for my favourite part of the show. This is where you send over your science questions to me as a review for us over on the Apple Podcast Store. Then I either find like a proper expert in the field to answer it for you, or I'll do all the hard work and I'll do all the digging and come up with it myself. This is from Evelyn, who asks, what's an itch? Well, an Evelyn, an itch, uh, is also known as a pruritus. It's caused by many different things. Maybe that's wind or a disease or heat or wind or uh, I said wind twice or, or maybe that something's on you. The thing is, we don't know that much about it. What we do know is from studying animals as well. Now, sometimes an itch is due to a release of a chemical uh, that your body makes to fight infection or bug bites. And the reaction to help heal yourself causes the itch. What scientists do know, though, is that it's a sensation that's usually triggered to make your brain aware of an external threat. We've evolved over time... for our skin to become very aware of everything that could harm us. You know, bugs or a change of temperature. 
And that itchy feeling is your skin's way of letting your brain know that something is up. Thanks for the question, Evelyn. Uh, This is from Teddy, who says, Why is Mars red? I think we've spoken about this on the show before, Teddy, so I'll quickly buzz through it for you. The surface of Mars has a red colour because its soil has iron oxide in it. And that's a molecule that gives rust the same colour too. Maybe, you know, when you leave your bike outside in the rain, it has that that fine, reddy, orangey, brown uh, film on it. Uh, That's from iron oxide. And the sky appears a lighter colour of red because the atmosphere, uh, well, because there's soil from the ground thrown up into the atmosphere and the light that bounces off it back to us reflects the colour. And finally, with our questions today, uh, someone that's not left their name properly but calls themselves I Love Your Podcasts, which I'm a fan of, so thank you, uh, asks, who founded electricity? I don't really think anyone founded it. It's kind of always been there, isn't it? It was more discovered, and usually that's, that's attributed to Benjamin Franklin, who was an amazing American. Now, scientists had played around with static electricity before that, but he came up with the idea that electricity had a positive and a negative charge and could flow between things. And to prove his idea, uh, he believed that lightning was a form of electricity. So in 1752, he conducted a famous kite experiment. He flew a kite in a thunderstorm. Not just that, he attached a metal key to the string to conduct the electricity. Then, just as he had suspected, the electricity in the storm clouds went down the kite, struck the key, gave him a shock, and proved that electricity had a current, a flow, and a charge. Brilliant question. Thank you so much for them. If you've got something that you want to ask, you need to leave it for me as a review uh, over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, Tutankhamun, Treasures of the Golden Pharaoh. It's bringing Tutankhamun's treasures to London for the last time, uh, we think, this November. And Dr Chris Norton is an Egyptologist, and he's here to explain some of the science behind ancient Egypt. Hey, Chris. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, can you just start without the science to begin and just give us a little bit of background about the myths uh, of the discovery of Tutankhamun. Uh, well, so the, the tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered in 1922 by Howard Carter. Um, and it was found to be intact, which means all of the treasures that he was buried with were undisturbed. They were pretty much exactly in the pos- position they were in when the priests left them with Tutankhamun's body. Um, and what year would that have been? 1922, almost exactly 100 years ago. Uh, and what year do we think Tutankhamun w- was laid down by the priest? It w- well, we don't know exactly, but it would be roughly three and a half thousand years ago, a little bit less than that. So about three and a half thousand years between the time the tomb was sealed up for the last time and the time Carter found it. Uh, and what did he find? I mean, we all know various bits of the story but can you kind of tie together the jigsaw for us and 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 just briefly talk through the timeline of him opening it and then everything that happened well the first thing he found um essentially before he he found the tomb he was in a a landscape there's a sort of almost like a moon like landscape of rocky chippings and and hills and he just dug into the ground found some steps first of all Beyond that, he found a blocked door. Then there was a a passageway, a corridor leading deep into the rock. With knowledge, sorry, Chris, did he he start digging with a slight clue of what might be underneath? Well, he knew that this was a part of the world where there were tombs of ancient Egyptian kings. So he knew that he was in the kind of place where he might find something like that. And he knew that Tutankhamun's tomb was missing. So of all the burials you might expect of kings, we know who the kings are, uh, and he knew which tombs had already been found, and Tutankhamun's was missing, and, and nobody had quite dug in exactly this place. So there was a bit of luck to it, but also at the same time, you know, he, he was clever enough to know where to look, and of course he was proven to be right. So he stumbles in, he finds all this gold in front of him, then what happens? Explain some of the myth around it with with lights going out and these things are happening that we think like, uh, you know, the curse of King Tut. Well, the, the tomb was absolutely full to bursting with treasures. So the first thing he had to do was to sort of rub his eyes and say, OK, what are we going to do here? He couldn't start moving things around because archaeologists need to record things in the, in the place where they're found before they go any further. So actually looking at everything and starting to move things around took months and years in fact 
And during that time, uh, a few strange things happened. So Carter's work was paid for by the Earl of Carnarvon. And it was really his project in some ways. He was the big boss. So when Carter first found the, the doorway intact, he, he summoned Carnarvon, who was there when they opened the tomb for the first time. And not very long after this, um, Carnarvon, in very unusual circumstances, uh, became very sick after he'd returned to Cairo um, and passed away. And at the same moment, there seems to have been a kind of a power cut and all the lights went out in the area um, that Carnarvon uh, died in. And his dog is supposed to have died at the exact same instant all the way away back home in this country, in, in England. So it, it, it seemed as though perhaps, you know, Carnarvon, who was responsible for breaking into this tomb, was being punished for it by death. Now, if we were to... Put aside the the myth and perhaps the uh, the supernatural element of this for just a second, and try and unpack some of the science. I, is there anything that you would know of where which would cause this? You know, someone perhaps going to Egypt for the first time, they would come down with something that maybe would have a very very quick period of them catching it to then ultimately dying. Well, I mean. Um there are lots of reasons why a person might get sick in a country like Egypt when they're visiting for the for the first time. The water, for example, is not is not safe for us to drink. Um, you have to be quite careful about that. You have to be careful eating anything that's been been washed in in the tap water. Um, there are bugs around, insects. Uh, it seems what happened in in Carnarvon's case is that he was bitten by a, a mosquito, and that bite which was bad enough that it got infected, and the infection got into his blood. Um, so, in, you know, in fact, there is quite a good scientific explanation for why he died, you know, that that doesn't require us to believe in, mm. in a curse. So, you know, he, he would have needed to be careful and perhaps, um, you know, perhaps he took a chance. He actually wasn't in tip top health himself anyway. Um, so maybe wasn't quite the person to be um, going into an Egyptian tomb that had been opened for the first time in thousands of years. When they're inside the tomb... And they suddenly see that glorious golden sarcophagus, the, the thing that we all know, you know, it, it just it looks incredible. So colourful, so well preserved. What would they have found inside? What would the mummified remains of King Tut have looked like? Well, it actually took them a very long time to get to that point because the body is con contained, of course, it's, it's wrapped, mummy wrappings. Um, there were lots of jewellery placed inside the wrappings, which they had to they had to um, to deal with as they were unwrapping it. There's a, a golden death mask uh, that was all inside a, a solid gold coffin. That uh, inside another gold coffin, another gold coffin, a stone sarcophagus, th uh, four massive shrines around that. So it took a very long time, but once they 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 were able to get to the body and to unwrap it, they found to their surprise um, somebody who was not very old at the time of death, um, probably around 18 or 19 years old. And as they began to study this closely, they began to see that actually uh, there were clues as to how he might have died and even how he might have lived. And um, it seems he might have had an accident that, that might have killed him, but also he might not have been very well for e even years, most of his life, possibly. So the mummy was, you know, really a, a great surprise in that way because, of course, all the gold and all the statues and things make, make you think of somebody who's really fit and healthy and the mummy says something different. You say he might not have been very well. What, what kind of things would have uh, affected a, an 18-year-old king back in those times? Well, you know, of course, medical uh, standards were not what they are now. Um, and more than that, though, in Tutankhamun's case, uh, he came from a family which was determined to preserve the sort of royal blood. And so it might seem very strange, but it wasn't unusual for kings to marry quite close relatives, uh, even brothers and sisters. And we now know they would have thought this was a great thing because for them, the royal blood was the best, you know, the best there was. So much better for a king to marry somebody else of royal blood than not. 
we now know that this isn't very healthy for people and that this can affect your your genetics and that can lead to inherited diseases and it's very possible that Tutankhamun actually was suffering from from something like this so he he was almost perhaps born with not as good a chance as as uh, as the rest of us might have of of living a healthy and long life as an Egyptologist, you've obviously been there many, many times, travelled up and down the Nile, seen all of these things. How much do we know about how the ancient Egyptians took care of their dead bodies, of their mummies? What were they embalming them with? How did that help preserve the life? Well, we, we actually we know a lot because a lot of mummies have survived and they uh, many of those have been unwrapped and they've been studied by scientists um, and this has been going on for a long time now uh, and in some cases mummies have been treated just like living people you know CT scanned and subjected to all kinds of tests that people would be now and that's allowed us to see an awful lot about um, how healthy people were um, and also, you know, what what might have been the cause of, of death of these people. Um, we, and it also, of course, allows us to see how those bodies were preserved. And after a few centuries of practice, the Egyptians were actually very, very good at this. So the best preserved mummies look really very lifelike, even though these are people who died thousands of years ago. Now, Tutankhamun, you know, is the most... Ro almost m the most romantic of stories that we're taught yeah. uh, right the way through school because mm -hmm. of uh, the supernatural element of how he was discovered as someone that knows a lot about all kinds of Egyptian discoveries and pharaohs are there any more that perhaps we should know about with as interesting stories that perhaps we don't know too much about um, I think yes and no. Um, there are lots and lots of other discoveries. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of tombs that have been discovered in Egypt, and some of them uh, have been found empty, completely robbed, but others of them have been found with lots of, you know, lots of things in them, mummies and coffins and other bits and pieces that ancient Egyptians were buried with. And all of those have a really interesting story to tell, but I think it's still true that the story of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb is the best one. And his treasures are coming back to uh, London at the Saatchi Gallery from November right the way through to May 2020. Can you tell us a bit more about the treasures that we'll actually get to see? Yes, there are 150 objects uh, from the tomb. There are actually a lot more discovered in the tomb, but I mean, there, each one of these things is a really, really beautiful object. And they all help tell the story of... Tutankhamun's life and the kinds of things he was doing. So there are objects which might relate to sort of recreational activities, hunting, riding around in a chariot. Um, there are bows and arrows. There are images of the kinds of animals he might have hunted. Um, and then there are objects which are connected with his body and his mummy and lots of statues of gods and goddesses um, and Tutankhamun in, in the journey that he has to make in the Egyptian imagination through the night to reach eternal life in the in in the hereafter in kind of heaven if you like um so you know there's a there's a great story here of how the Egyptians did things and what their beliefs were there's a great story of Howard Carter's discovery of the tomb but also these are just really beautiful things you know there are animals, you know, human beings, got, like I say, gods, goddesses, there's loads of beautiful jewellery. Everything is made by craftsmen who were as good as good as it got. And they're all made of amazing materials like gold and precious stones. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's really a huge amount to see and a huge lot, amount to think about as well. Lastly... Death is traditionally uh, surrounded in, in many tradition, much, much tradition even today. If you think when someone dies, when they're buried, you throw dirt onto the mm. coffin. What, can, what do we know of from the treasures of some of the traditions of uh, rituals of death back in ancient Egypt? What were pharaohs entombed with? Well, they were entombed, the ones who were lucky enough to have a rich collection of things like Tutankhamun were, were entombed with all kinds of objects, um, some of which would have been things they used in their lives. So, you know, they wanted to take with them their favourite things. Some of them were things which wouldn't have been used in life, but would be used in the afterlife. And they imagined that the afterlife was a kind of perfect version of our life. So if King Tut liked hunting he would want to have an amazing bow and arrow made of of, of, of gold encrusted uh, wood that's what he did have and you can see that in the exhibition um, and they were buried with 
things that they would need to to make the journey through the afterlife. So my favourite thing in the exhibition is a statue of Tutankhamun who's who's shown with a kind of golden gleaming body um, standing on the back of a black panther um, who is helping to convey him through the netherworld. So what Tutankhamun has to do when he dies is he makes this journey and he has to fight sort of demons and beasties, particularly dangerous snakes. And this this leopard or panther is going to help him on that journey. And this statue shows that really clearly. I know the word exhibition can sometimes be a bit daunting, but it's absolutely worth checking out. If, if you've got a day out, there's six months for you to make the most of it. It's Tutankhamun, Treasures of the Golden Pharaoh. It's at the Saatchi Gallery, which is in London. Have a quick Google. You can find it. No worries. Um, Chris, thank you so much for selling us more. Thanks for having me. Now, for this week's Dangerous Dan, we're headed to the north of the UK to step inside one of the world's most famous gardens. Annick Castle is in Northumberland, right at the top of England, and in 1996, it became the home of the Poison Garden. The Duchess of Annick Castle, who kind of owns it, said that she had the idea to make something unique uh, and utterly deadly. And inside, it holds a wide range of some of the most toxic plants on the planet. It has over a hundred species, and they've all got the potential to kill you. You know it straight away. On the gates when you walked in are marked the words, These plants can kill you. And there are signs everywhere saying, Keep off and don't touch. When you go inside the gates, you'll see things like the Stichos Nux Vomica, which is the home of strychnine, a poison which makes you convulse and choke. Also, you'll see Ricinus Communis, which gives off the deadly ricin poison. Also, there's Foxglove. We've talked about that on the show before. There's Altropa Belladonna, uh, which is one of the most toxic plants you'll ever find. It's a poison. Well, it's poison, sorry, has unpredictable effects, including heart diseases, stomach problems, psychiatric disorders. Also, when you're in there, you'll see Brugman which is known as angels trumpets as well they look like a hanging bell and they can make you hallucinate it's all there in this poison garden in Annick Castle which is not your usually beautiful English country garden after all Weather's a funny thing and the seasons are strange, aren't they? Right now where I'm recording it here in the UK, it's freezing cold and chilly outside, but I know that you might be listening to this in Australia, the other side of the world where you're just getting into the summer. So right now we'll learn about how different weathers around the world affect everyone else with Marina Ventura, and this is our Climate Explorers series. Marina Ventura's Climate Explorers. Hi there, Marina Ventura here. I love finding out about the natural world, and that includes the Earth's climate. We know that weather can change from one day to the next, but climates can change too over the time span of years, centuries, or even longer. So I'm on a mission to fill MapApp with the latest climate information with the help of some awesome climate explorers. Come on then, let's go! A bit of rain is something we're used to in this country. Sometimes it's fun to get your wellies on and jump in some puddles. Rain is important for life, providing water to drink and keep clean and helping crops and plants to grow. People also like to live near water. It's relaxing and a great source of fun. But too much rainwater can cause very serious problems, causing rivers to overflow and flood the surrounding areas, filling houses, schools and shops with water. You can imagine how scary that might be and how much damage would be done if that happened in your neighbourhood. You might even have to leave your home to stay somewhere else. Climate explorers are very interested in studying rainfall and flooding to help us prepare for when these things happen and to help prevent them causing damage. That's right, Marina. It's something that's becoming more important. Rising global temperatures may cause heavier rainfall events as well as sea levels to rise. So flooding is something that's not going to go away. Time to meet our next climate explorer. Hi, I'm Kate and I'm a flood scientist. Floods kill more people than anything else on the planet and are something which can affect us here in the UK. We can't just hope they don't happen. We have to accept that they are a part of life and do our best to reduce the impact they have. Storm Desmond saw the highest ever amount of rainfall recorded in the UK in one day. Flooding isn't just becoming more frequent, but the levels of floodwater are becoming higher too. 
In 2015, flooding in Cumbria broke some of our strongest flood defences. My job is to try to work out what will happen to rivers when there is a lot of rainfall. If we know where the river will overflow, then we can take measures to prevent damage to homes. Great to know there is something we can do. But how can you tell where the overflows will be? We can make computer models of rivers and chuck a load of virtual water into them. We keep going until the water starts to jump out. When there is a real flood, we collect real data to see if our models were correct, whether the areas with the most flooding match what our computer model predicted. Sounds like you get rather wet. Well, luckily we have a drone, a small flying robot that uses sensors like infrared and thermal imaging to take measurements. Ours is called Firefly. It flies above the areas affected to collect the data. Wow, I'd love to be a drone. We'll have to get you some wings. Thanks, Kate. Even though we can't easily prevent natural disasters like flooding, it's good to know that climate explorers are working hard to help us limit the damage they can do. It certainly is. The more we know, the better we can prepare. And now we know more about flooding too, don't we? Ready for upload, Mappy? Load me up. Next time, we'll be looking at how animals can help us understand changes to the climate. See you soon. Marina Ventura's Climate Explorers, supported by the Natural Environment Research Council, the science of the natural world. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash marina. Right, let's do this week's Science in the News. Scientists uh, have made artificial nerve cells paving the way for new ways of repairing the body. Tiny brain chips, which behave like real cells, could be used to treat diseases like Alzheimer's. They use a circuit to do what neurons do naturally, carry signals across the body. Uh, Also, experts say that average temperatures for the last 10 years look set to be the warmest decade on record. Uh, Provisional figures from the World Meteorological Organization suggest that this year is on course to be the second or third warmest year ever ever. They say that this exceptional global heat is caused uh, by greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, invasive animal species are taking over natural national parks in America. A recent survey of the 85 million acres of the parks across the states found that 1,409 populations of invasive animals made up of 331 species are taking over. Fish, snakes and other pests uh, are proving a significant ecological threat uh, and it's risking damaging all of the parks. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for having a listen. If you've got a science question that you want answered to, uh, next week, uh, we did three today, so there's loads of room to squeeze yours in. If there's something niggling around your brain that you've heard, perhaps it's something Christmassy because we're coming to that time of the year right now. If there's something that you want answered, you just need to leave it for me as a review over on Apple Podcasts. There's a little comment box at the bottom when you leave your review. That's where you put the question. Uh, give us five stars so I can help see it. It helps me see it rather uh, and leave your name as well so I can say hello to you. While you're on Apple Podcasts, it's a brilliant place for you to listen to all of our science series. You've heard some today. We've got them also on Google and on Spotify and on our free Fun Kids app. And Fun Kids, we're a children's radio station from the UK. You can hear us all around the country on your DAB digital radio on that free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. 